you were that agent that identified them um, despite sort of doubt potentially uh, and some pressure from other organizations otherwise. So it's such a pleasure to have you here with me today, Bill. And let's start with um, your initiation into law enforcement and what made you uniquely suited for this particular fugitive case. Well, at an early age, uh, my father became an Indiana State Trooper, so I was surrounded by law enforcement uh, from about the age of five until uh, I got out of college. And within uh, a short time of graduating from Indiana State, he had approached me about um, working undercover. Um, so I went from college back to high school, uh, where <laughs> I was a high school student in LaPorte, Indiana, um, with the purpose of identifying uh, locations and individuals that were trafficking in the sale of controlled substances in that high school. Um, during that time, the state of Indiana hired me um, as a police officer. And then a couple of years later, I had an opportunity through a case that I worked in Indiana uh, to meet some of the people from the Marshal Service. And within about uh, two to three months from beginning to end of the process, uh, I became a deputy U.S. Marshal in 1986. One of uh, my favorite anecdotes of yours, Bill, is your story about uh, how you showed up to a U.S. Secret Service interview while you were undercover at this high school. Can you tell that? Yeah, I, I had uh, taken the Treasury exam the day that I left Indiana State University, drove to Indianapolis, took the Treasury exam for the Secret Service. And so the interview followed a number of months later. At that particular time, I was still working at the high school and the the long hair that I had um, and that type of persona, I, I really couldn't get rid of at that point. So I went for the interview and I, I knew the minute that I walked in and the guy looked at me that uh, it, this wasn't going to be a successful interview. I tried to explain to him what I was doing and, and I'm sure if he read my application, he knew. But uh, I knew at that point that I did not have a future in the Secret Service. <laughs> picturing sort of a 21 Jump Street uh, looking character uh, in, in, in front of the U.S. Secret Service there in that interview. Um, and so now you are a United States Marshal. And what case did you work on in 1987 that sort of sparked and was the genesis for your, your ultimate fugitive experience? You know, within the Marshal Service, there's a lot of different responsibilities. The agency was formed to provide for the integrity of the U.S. court system when George Washington became president. So that is the primary function uh, today, as it was in 1789 when he created the U.S. Marshals. But there are varying functions and responsibilities that have grown over the years, fugitive apprehension, asset seizure, the witness protection program, the movement of federal prisoners. There's really a place for a lot of different people in the agency. Uh, within a very short period of time, once I was assigned to the San Diego office, there was a case there uh, by the name of Thomas Hercules Pepinos, who was a uh, entrepreneur at that time in the development of methamphetamine and the process for manufacturing it. And he had been indicted in the early 1980s in San Diego, and he, along with all of his co-conspirators, um, many of them had fled. So our chief at the time, Bob DeGuerra, he wanted to form a local task force. Uh, Pepinos had gone on to our nationwide most wanted list, and he wanted to make the effort to uh, apprehend him after a number of years of really nothing happening with the case. And I was one of the people selected to be on that, that small group of four people, basically, uh, to work that case. And... What ultimately did you discover in the file and what events transpired that led to your identification um, and ultimately bringing him in? Yeah, it had been, uh, it was a large file. Uh, it took me weeks and maybe even months to go through the whole thing that had taken place over many years. Uh, but within the file, I found a, a name in there of Thomas Peter Dussel that was supposedly an alias that Pepinos was using. Nobody working the case uh, during that time or previously could tell me where that information came from. So I kind of took it and ran with it and I found a California driver's license and I ordered it up. And when I got the photograph and the right thumbprint back, um, I thought it was definitely Tom Pepino's based on the previous pictures that we had. Uh, the, 
the one of the other people working the case did not think so. And uh, so we went to the right thumbprint and compared it with the known fingerprints of Pepinos. And the guy said, it's not him. So I still thought it was. Um, I was convinced of it just by the, the photograph itself. So I went to a friend uh, over at the FBI. They were located in the federal building in San Diego at the time. I went over there and I said, teach me how to read fingerprints quick. I need, I need to understand this. I had, I had had some courses previously at the Indiana Law Enforcement Academy and at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, but nothing really in depth. Um, so he handed me a book and he said, hey, here you go. And uh, I, I taught myself how to read fingerprints. And in the next couple of weeks, I figured out that when Pepinos, who was using the name of Ducell, had provided his right thumbprint, he had turned it 180 degrees um, in an in a abnormal way of providing it at that time. And I had uh, identified all of the minutia and characteristics within that. And I was able to convince the guys I was working with that it was, in fact, Tom Papinos that was using that name. From there, it was um, a simple interview in Portland, Oregon, by one of our inspectors. Uh, with some of the, the things that we found connected to the name Ducell. And we had information that Tom Papinos and his co-defendant wife and another individual that were, was on the indictment were all in Bullhead City, Arizona. And within a couple of days, they were all three in custody uh, in Bullhead City, Arizona. And, and I flew to Arizona and brought them back once they were removed to San Diego. Wow. Interesting parallels that we will see emerge in the Beltway Snipers case as well of your gut feeling uh, mixed with an incredible uh, detailed assessment of facts and evidence that led to a conclusion that you had to sort of convince others of that ultimately was absolutely correct. So, Bill, let's now go to 2002 and let's talk about the Beltway Snipers case and the events that transpired. Okay. Where would you like to start? Um, well, I think let's start with the federal involvement into it and essentially your introduction and your entree okay. into that case. Yeah, it was uh, Friday, October 4th, and we had gotten a call from the Montgomery County Police. They had worked with uh, a fugitive task force in the Washington, D.C. area. They were familiar with our technical expertise, and they were asking us uh, if we could come up for a meeting. So three of us traveled to Rockville, and we were briefed by a commander there on the spate of shootings that happened the previous day where five people were killed in Montgomery County, and one was killed over just across the line in Washington, D.C. as well. Um, based on all of that and the briefing that we got, we agreed to take the information back and look at some technical things that we could do. Um, including working with the uh, Maryland Department of Transportation, Virginia Department of Transportation for uh, freeway cameras, uh, breaking all that information down, um, gathering as much video as we could, doing some um, kind of unique things um, cellular or digital wise that we had become familiar with a year earlier during our time at Ground Zero in New York while we were supporting the New York Police Department and trying to find survivors in the debris field at Ground Zero. Uh, we had worked with a group there called the Wireless Emergency Response Team, where we had done some kind of unique um, applications to identify active cell phones in that debris field. Um, and we used that, uh, those technologies and those applications as we're now moving forward in the, in the sniper investigation. Mm -hmm. So when, when, after we had that meeting, we all went back to Springfield, and within a very short period of time, we had heard of another shooting in the uh, Fredericksburg area. Whether or not it was connected with these shootings, most people thought no, probably not because of the distance, when all the other shootings that had happened the previous two days, actually, uh, October 2nd and October 3rd, they were all uh, centered within a small area up in Montgomery County and just across the line into uh, Washington, D.C. So, but we heard uh, pretty soon after, maybe 5, 30, 6 o'clock, that it was indeed connected to the sniper killings. 
that had been connected ballistically uh, through ATF. The woman that was shot there, her name was Carolyn Sewell. She survived the shooting, and the bullet went through her and went into the dashboard of her car. So we had the projectile from that. We had projectiles from uh, some of the previous shootings as well that Walter Dandridge from the ATF was able to make a comparison with and identify all of those projectiles as coming from the same weapon. And what was the turnaround time of that forensic analysis? How soon after that Fredericksburg shooting was that ATF agent who was instrumental uh, in determining the, that kind of high-powered rifle and the connection? How soon was he able to make that conclusion for that particular shooting? Uh, it was late, late afternoon, early evening on the Friday the 4th. Um, okay. I remember I had met Walter Dandridge um, the previous day, I believe, um, uh, or, or that afternoon. Uh, he, he was already examining projectiles that had been recovered from the Montgomery shootings the, uh, on the 3rd. So uh, he did, he was a, an incredible asset to this and a critical piece to it. And I consider him a hero um, in this case. He was able to link these shootings very quickly um, because there, there were shootings that were happening that were not connected to this as well. Many mm -hmm. He probably examined more of those that were not connected than were actually connected to the sniper shootings. So he did a fantastic job and, and kept the momentum going with where we knew these shootings were happening that were all connected ballistically to the same uh, weapon. So the federal government or the, the federal agencies had been invited in. Uh, so now there's a constellation and a... A joint operations command center uh, from which everyone was operating. And then we had the scope being determined of how prolific these shootings and murders were occurring and as well, that sort of randomness. So tell us what happened next. Well, we start we started bringing people into the area from our fugitive task forces across the, the country, from New York and from Los Angeles. We had a regional fugitive task force in Washington, D.C. that was already working that. Plus, our offices in Virginia and Washington, D.C. And, and Maryland were all involved. We had hundreds and hundreds of people. We also brought in some specialists for our, from our electronic surveillance unit um, that were that were very versed in tracking communications. So we just continued to, to monitor everything, look at things that we could help with and uh, support the investigation. And then everything changed um, on October 7th when Iran Brown was shot uh, outside of Tasker Middle School in Bowie, Maryland. Uh, there had been a, a, a statement from uh, the police chief uh, over the weekend that children are safe, um, and obviously the, the snipers were listening at that uh, because they took advantage of that statement and, and shot Iran Brown outside of his school. That was another critical part. Not only did it elevate the investigation now that a child had been shot, but it also provided some hard evidence. Um, the, the, one of the assets that the marshal service was able to provide that day was a, uh, explosive detection canine, uh, by the name of Beacon. Uh, he and his handler, Mike Pio, uh, Mike had developed the canine program within the agency primarily to support, you know, judicial security and courthouses and, and special events, and um, he brought his dog out that day, and, and the, the, the initial search that Mike and Beacon did did not turn up anything. But Mike had been in the military. He went to where the backpack was, where Iran Brown had been shot, and he started to look around for vantage points of where someone could have shot from. And he noticed a place just to the north, a wooded area to the north, and as he and Beacon examine that area, uh, Beacon alerted to an area that appeared to be matted down where a person was sitting or lying down for a long period of time. Uh, it was shortly after that where a shell casing from a rifle was found, and then they brought in more searchers, they brought in uh, cadets from the training academy, and they were able to locate a tarot card. Um, at the time, it was described to me as just a death card. I really wasn't sure what they were saying, but, um, and, I, and I didn't physically see it. Um, it had been taken into evidence, and there, there was a lot of possibility as far as forensic data that, was, that might be available there. There was handwriting on it. Uh, there was potential DNA on it. We now had a shell casing uh, that would help us identify the weapon, and um, 
it was being held very closely. Uh, there was a message on it uh, not to release to the press, but it, it was it got out that night and the next morning, that, that evening on the news and early the next day in the Washington Post. Although the statement that was provided in those news reports was uh, the, the language was was not accurate with what it was on the card. So given that, the fact that there was a leak when there was explicit construction directions not to uh, engage with media in that way, and also the fact that, that it was wrong, did, did that tell you that the leaker was not a member of law enforcement that somehow had heard it firsthand or secondhand or somehow overheard something because it was inaccurate? And who would risk the integrity of the investigation by leaking in the first place? Yeah, I have a feeling that it was someone within law enforcement, but someone that didn't see the the document itself because they because of the mm. the wording that was was incorrectly provided to the press. But there were so many agencies and and so many um, law enforcement representatives involved at this point. It, it had to come from law enforcement, but I really wasn't concerned about it. You know, I took it for what the value was to to us as investigators, and just tried to move forward with it. Um, I did some research on on tarot cards and and what they meant, and tried to understand it a little bit better to to maybe give me an indication of who the person was behind this. So, Bill, tell us at that point in time of the investigation, was there a profile, and what? or who exactly was the public looking for? Because it's my understanding that there was not yet a conclusive evidence that there were two. So now we use the word snipers, plural, but at that point in the investigation, we thought there was just one. Yeah, we were proceeding that there was a, it was a single individual at that time. Um, the uh, information on the tarot card uh, said, I am God, or call me God. Uh, so that would indicate a, a singular person. We, we would later change our, our outlook on that, but there was a profile being developed by the FBI at that time, and that process would continue um, throughout the entire investigation. That would change as more information and more evidence was developed. There was both a suspect profile being developed and a geographic profile being developed about where the person may strike next based on the other shootings. And the profile that was being put out there was that it was probably a white male in his late 20s, early 30s. He may have uh, recently had a, a relationship issue, a divorce or a, um, a separation from a loved one, maybe a military person, um, white male. Um, so that's what we were proceeding with. and. There was also the issue of uh, one of the witnesses at the Montgomery series of shootings on the 3rd had observed a utility truck, a white box truck or a van. Um, so that was being looked at as a, as a serious piece of information. And that was put out to the media as well. So now every shooting that took place, um, people were seeing white vans and white box trucks and utility trucks everywhere. And, and once you started looking for them, you understood that during a normal business day in the Washington, D.C. area, there are thousands and thousands of those uh, around the area. And so after Monday, October 7th, changed everything, as you said, um, with the investigation developing, then the shooters, one of them, actually called in to 911. Can you share about that? Yeah, they they called into Rockville uh, Police Department on, I believe, October 15th. Um, and that was answered by a um, dispatcher who... We actually have that audio, Bill, so let's play it and then we'll get your reaction on the other okay. side. Don't say anything, where the people are calling the killing in your area? Look on the tarot card. He says, call me God. Do not release the prayer. He has called you three times before, trying to cut a He has gotten no response. People have died. Yes, sir. I need to agree to that. Montgomery County Police Highline. We're not investigating the crime. Do you like the number? Yeah. 
Yeah, so th that call came in on the 15th, but we wouldn't become aware of that until I believe the 19th. Um, and the way we became aware of it was when there was a shooting at the Ponderosa Steakhouse in Ashland, Virginia, uh, investigators found a, um, like a freezer bag tacked to a tree near where the shooter had been positioned when he shot one of the uh, patrons as he exited the, the restaurant. Uh, they found a shell casing there as well. And, but inside that, um, Inside that that package was a four page note, and it had a number of different uh, telephone numbers and individuals that had uh, been attempted to be contacted by the snipers, including CNN, uh, Rockville Police Department. Uh, I think they all identified an officer, Derek, uh, which was Derek Belisles, who took two calls from the snipers as well. Uh, but that note gave us at the electronic surveillance unit the foundation for what we needed to put together um, and start investigating the origin of these calls. We Now that we knew where they terminated, we could make a, a really good effort at determining where they originated and how they were processed. Was it done through a computer? Was it done through a calling card? Uh, was it done with coins? Was it from a hard line? Um, we found that all the calls were, were made using coin phones at that time. Um, but that letter provided us with the foundation to really establish how they were communicating uh, from around the area. I have to admit, I'm obviously without any law enforcement experience, but it's sort of hard to hear that call because what I'm hearing potentially is someone maybe not taking the caller seriously. And what I'm hearing is someone, a shooter, who is saying, I am responsible for these shootings. And then the, the dispatcher saying, please call this hotline. So upon analysis of the case in, in retrospect, um, were, was there any assessment of that call or the fact that the shooters had called multiple times without a substantive response? Yeah, and I think it was complicated by the fact that uh, calls were coming in to the FBI hotline, to America's Most Wanted, to police departments uh, in the area, to a, a priest in Ashland, Virginia. Um, there were many people claiming to be the shooters. So, you know, which one do you take seriously? Which one do you not take seriously? Which one do you pursue? Which one do you not pursue? Um, gathering all those tips, all that information, you do your best uh, to take what's in the call and evaluate what you can. If it's a call saying that I saw the shooter a week ago at you know the 7-Eleven in this city, there's really not much you can do other than maybe grab video from that. Um, but a person that's calling saying I am the shooter or I am the sniper, they were getting a lot of calls at every one of those hotlines. So I didn't think it was that unusual that you know I wish she had handled it a little differently um, and passed it directly to um, uh, maybe a, a sergeant or a lieutenant or to the task force directly. Um, but in the end, um, it helped us figure out where they were standing when they made that call. Tell us about that. That call was made from a Texaco station in Woodbridge, Virginia. Um, no, knowing what time and to what number it terminated, it was simple for, for us to figure out where it originated. We knew that at that point that it was processed using coins, um, which helps us out a lot because if a person's using a calling card, eventually that's gonna run out and they're gonna get another one and it's gonna take you a few days to catch up. Or if they're using a cell phone and they make two calls and throw it in the Potomac and get a new one, it's gonna take you a few more days to catch up to that. But they were using coins every time. Mm -hmm. So we were developing now a, a mapping element that was showing us where they were when they were making all of these calls. And we were not only looking at for that one specific call, we would examine calls that were made two hours before the known call and two hours afterwards. Did they only make one call while they were there? Or did they, did you know, the caller call a relative beforehand or after um, using, you know, the same method just to let somebody know they're okay. But it, it provided a roadmap for us 
of where they were at specific times and dates. And then we could go out and try to get video uh, from some of those commercial areas. Uh, we did not find any, as I recall, uh, at any of the locations. Maybe that's an indication that they, they did their homework and chose places that didn't have cameras. I can't say that for sure, but um, um, it seems kind of um, conspicuous that of all the calls they made, none of them were captured on video. Hmm. So at that time, these these pivotal moments um, and pivotal shootings where the killers were leaving more and more clues, that plastic bag with all the lists enabled you to determine that 911 call had occurred in addition to two others. You then were able to trace the origination of that to this Texaco station. So describe for us the pace as things were, it sounds, heating up and you were gleaning more and more information. Was this leading you closer to identifying them or was it just accumulating that evidence at a faster pace, but you were still searching for who they were? Yeah, we, well, we were still trying to identify them, but every piece mm -hmm. of information that we were getting that was um, connected to the shootings or the phone calls was, was leading us in that direction. Uh, I, I think everybody was pretty confident that we, we were heading in the right direction with the, the phone calls itself and other information that was in that, uh, that Ashland letter. There was a reference in there to a call to a priest. We were able to identify that priest. He was interviewed and he provided some quite specific information about the two people that were on the phone with him, one older, one younger, one with an accent. Um, he knew about the shootings, but he didn't report it to the police in, until we got there and, and did the interview. So that, along with all of the calling data and the information in the Ashland letter where they were demanding $10 million to be deposited into an account, um, we, we worked on that. We had a financial surveillance unit that we activated for that. They looked into that information and found that that credit card had been stolen from a woman in Arizona, that she was a bus driver. And when she had returned from one of her trips, she noticed that her credit card was gone. Um, we found that that card had been uh, attempted to be used in Washington State for a $12 gasoline purchase. Um, so now we had a connection to Washington, but but what did we have? There was something there, but we didn't know what at that time. Um, so we just kept digging. I think at the Marshal Service, um, it was a bit more frantic than probably other places. But there's also an element that's still chasing down every shooting that's happening. And they seem to happen in new jurisdictions every single time. Mm -hmm. In Fairfax and in Prince William County, Spotsylvania, Manassas, um, it brought in new agencies every single time. And the more agencies you have in something like this, it can get complicated because each one of those agencies have a responsibility to investigate that particular matter. So all of the information doesn't necessarily get shared to the other seven or eight uh, locations where these shootings have happened. And the public at that time, there was an increasing heightened level of abject fear as well, that was sweeping across the nation and certainly in the DMV area with the increase and, in, in, um, you know, with the, all of the shootings that were happening. Well, we were only a year removed from the events of 9-11. So that fear of something else happening was always there. And I think the initial theory that everyone was looking at was this is another um, attempt at terrorizing the United States, um, a well-organized one at that, you know, where people aren't leaving many clues or, you know, about these shootings. It got to the point where they thought it was related to the 9-11 events so much that prisoners or detainees at Guantanamo Bay were interviewed about any potential knowledge they may have about um, plans to conduct shootings in the Washington, D.C. area. Mm. And just the images on national media of people hiding at the gas pump and running to their cars with groceries. I mean, it was a, uh, it impacted the, the lives and the lifestyles of millions of people. Yeah, there were, there were no um, athletic events for students. Uh, they weren't let out at, at lunchtime to, to play. Um, outdoor dining was non-existent um, in the area. 
the gas stations were a place of fear. People would, I, I had heard stories where people would drive 20 to 30 miles away from 95 to get gas because 95 was looked at as the corridor where most of these were happening. Um, but there, there was a real fear in the area. Everybody talked about it. Everybody knew about it. Um, and everybody felt it. So as the investigation continued, what happened next? Based on the call into one of the calls into Derek Belisles at Montgomery County and the information in, the, in that Ashland letter, we were now beginning to look at multiple people being involved. There were references in that letter to uh, things that were plural. We um, and we, we knew at that point, based on the pastor statements um, and everything that was developing, that we were probably dealing with two people. But why? And 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 what has brought them to Washington D.C.? That was the question. Um, and what can we do to better respond to these shootings quicker? So there was a strategy developed where when a shooting happened, because of the proximity to Interstate 95, um, freeways were shut down. The minute that a shooting happened that we thought was connected to the, the sniper shootings, the freeways were shut down. And I happened to be at the mixing bowl area where 395, 495, and 95 all come together near Springfield, Virginia, um, the day that um, there was a shooting in Massaponics area at a gas station there. It, I've, I've never seen traffic like that in my life. I mean, traffic was backed up for 70 miles to Richmond and and up into um, uh, Maryland uh, to the east and, and north and all the way up to Virginia on the west side of 95. I've never seen anything like it before except um, the morning of 9-11 when um, people were trying to get out of Washington, D.C. and we were trying to get our unit down into Washington, D.C. Um, that's the only comparable thing that I've ever seen. Um, but but we were we were trying to notice anything we could. We figured that they were mobile, um, still looking for this white vehicle. Um, although most people in law enforcement at this point, you know, uh, a week, 10 days into this, we felt pretty confident that every white utility vehicle in you know, a 500 mile radius had been stopped and examined and identified at this point. You could just drive down 95 and you'd, you know, for 10 miles and you'd see three of them pulled over. So there was a log being kept of all those vehicles that were being stopped. And I think we were all convinced maybe this isn't good information at this point uh, because we would have had it by now, we've, we felt. Um, so collectively taking all that information, the pastor's information, the Ashland letter. Um, I had had a conversation with two investigators from our fugitive task force in um, New York, uh, Vinny Senzamichi, who was a state parole officer assigned to our task force, and Lenny DePaul, who was a, an inspector assigned to our task force. And we were having a conversation about my notes that I had made about the Ashland letter. I had a chance to review it. I couldn't, I couldn't make a copy, um, and they weren't willing to fax it. So I had to write it down and replicate what that looked like and the phone numbers that were in it and everything as quickly as I could at the command post in um, Montgomery County. Um, so we were having a conversation and, and Vinny Senzamichi said, you know, this looks like it has some Jamaican stuff connected to it. He, he had investigated Jamaican gangs in New York and he felt pretty strongly that there were some Jamaican um, overtones to it. Uh, the word is bond message, the five stars. Um, and as we started looking into it and looking at what the pastor had said about the accent, um, it continued to move in that direction that, you know, maybe there is a Jamaican connection here. So shortly after that, one of the things that happened was the the, the letter is discovered tacked to the tree late that evening on a Saturday night. And part of the message is that the, the snipers will be making a phone call into the Ponderosa to negotiate early the next morning, I believe 6 a.m. I, I was looking at the letter at probably 11 o'clock in the morning. As I, as I, after I copied it as much as I could down and drove away, I 
was still looking at my notes and trying to make sense of it and calling people into the office and, you know, to run down some of this stuff. I, I saw the part in there about the phone call. And so I, I drove back to the command post and I said, well, what happened with this call? I mean, nobody, nobody said anything about that. And they said, well, we didn't open the package until afterwards. Mm. So the phone at the Ponderosa rang. There were still officers outside. They heard it ring, but it went un- unanswered. So it required Chief Moose to go out again and make another plea to, you know, those people, whoever is responsible at that point, to contact them again. And that gave us, uh, you know, a number of hours to get some electronic um, applications in place to capture that call into the Ponderosa, forward that call to the command post in Montgomery County and be able to record that and do what we could to exploit that. We also put surveillance teams out and the, the natural places to put the surveillance teams out were, were the locations where we had known telephone calls from in the past. So those were all being covered that Monday morning, um, 24 hours later now from when they had asked for the call. But we, we now had another shot at this, or we're hoping to, and the call did come in um, early that Monday morning. Uh, it was a uh, it had a, a inter- introduction to it, uh, the same thing that we had become familiar with, with um, Call Me God, you know, do not release to the press. Um, And then it was uh, a recording, about a 35-second recording. So they hung up. Um, It was less than one minute. Um, The information was provided to uh, our representative at the command post. He turned it around and had the origin of the call very quickly, which was another gas station, very close to the area where we had surveillance units. Um, so everybody started to move in Lenny DePaul, who had had quite a bit of experience managing task forces and things like this for many years. He tried to get everybody organized, get a, uh, a perimeter on the location and kind of slowly move in. And that didn't last very long because there were so many people involved in this, that people rushed into that lot, um, because they saw a white van with two individuals sitting at a payphone, they thought it was the two snipers still on the phone. Um, I was in Springfield, Virginia, and coordinating with the the carrier for the call. And the woman on the other end was telling me that uh, she gave me the number where it originated. She said it was a, a, a 38 second call total, I believe. And I gave her the, the, information about the phone number where the two individuals in the van were. And she said, that's not the right one. So I had Lenny DePaul look through the, the gas station and he found another pay phone across from that van. And that, that was the number that corresponded with the incoming call. So I have no doubt that Muhammad and Malvo saw that white van there with us uh, next to a pay phone, making a call and they used that as a distraction. Um, and we later knew that they were probably sitting nearby watching the activity uh, when everybody responded to that parking lot. But they had made the call um, and, then, and then left that pay phone and uh, all the attention was directed toward that van. A few questions. Number one, what was the substance of the approximately 30 second recording? Um. I don't remember much about what was in it. I think it was just telling the um, telling Chief Moose basically to make an announcement that they had caught the snipers like a duck in a noose. It really didn't make sense to any of us, you know, what that phrase was, but it was asking Chief Moose to deliver that message as a sign that he that they understood the call, basically. But it was a pre-recorded call. They they had a small tape recorder. And um, it it was a very short call in the end. And how soon after the response by law enforcement to the white van with two other people in it at at the payphone next to or across from where the snipers actually had been prior, how soon after that call was that um, 
was your correct information. So essentially, law enforcement, were they still there dealing with the occupants of that van? And then you, you know, one minute later say, you guys, that's not the right payphone. Or was this a matter of an hour later? Or what was that duration like for you? Uh, the investigators with the marshal service, both in Montgomery County and at the gas station in in uh, near Richmond and in Springfield, where I was, we knew within 15 to 20 minutes that it, it was the wrong guys. The two individuals that were on the phone began their call at 757 and were still on the phone 20 minutes later when everybody rolled into the lot. So their their call had span the entire time of, you know, the 38 seconds right at 8 a.m. when the snipers made their call. So we, we knew very quickly that it was the wrong one. Uh, the, the number at the phone did not match. Um, and we were beginning to move on. The media and everybody else uh, believed this thing was over. And it even confused uh, the media at the press conference later that morning they were expecting Chief Moose to have a good announcement. And when he announced the, the duck and the noose uh, phrase, um, it confused people. They Everybody thought that the two men had been captured. But um, we knew right away um, within the marshal service that it was not the right guys. So we kept working at it. You know, we kept looking at uh, everything that we could. And behind the scenes, the there and there was some confusion about this. One of the callers into um, Derek Belisles had mentioned a, a, a liquor store robbery in Montgomery, Alabama. So the confusion between Montgomery, Alabama, and Montgomery, Maryland um, existed for a few days, but finally figured it out. And when Montgomery, Alabama Police Department was contacted, they were able to find the, a robbery down there that these guys had made reference to when they talked to Officer Belisles, as well as uh, some of their comments to the pastor in Ashland. So based on that, you know, the detectives in Montgomery, Alabama, they reviewed all of their information. It was a, a, a robbery of a liquor store. One woman was shot and killed. Uh, the other woman was uh, shot and seriously uh, wounded. She recovered from her wounds. Um, but they, one of the items that they had recovered down there was a um, gun catalog. And so that was, they had retrieved a, a fingerprint off of that. But because Alabama did not have a, um, a relationship with ex the exchanging of information for fingerprints with the FBI, it, it never went to their system. So that fingerprint and that catalog were flown to, to uh, Washington, D.C. The fingerprint was examined, and it was identified with um, Lee Boyd Malvo. Now, that's I, I, uh, that happened on Tuesday morning, um, and there was a bit of chaos that morning as well because the latest shooting had happened a couple of hours earlier. Conrad Johnson, a bus driver, had stepped off of his bus and had been shot and killed. So the entire attention of the task force out of uh, Montgomery County and Rockville was uh, toward that, that latest shooting. Uh, there was another note found there. Uh, there was a bag, uh, like a duffel bag with some goggles and a couple of other things found in it. So we were convinced um, almost immediately that another, you know, they were responsible for another shooting. Um, but uh, late that morning, I got a call from an ATF agent uh, at the command post, and he said, hey, um, I, I need to provide you with this information. That fingerprint from the catalog came back to Lee Boyd Mallow. He gave me the FBI number. He gave me his date of birth. He said they're not taking it seriously here because um, – he doesn't fit the white male profile in the right age. He's, he's a juvenile, um, and he just doesn't fit the profile that, that we're looking at. So I said, give, give me the information. I'll take it. So I, I, I took it, and over the next couple hours, I started doing everything I could on Lee Boyd Malvo. I had a stack of maybe 10 other suspects um, you know, that we were looking at and trying to either eliminate as suspects through a, a digital – analysis process, maybe putting them at a crime scene or not putting them at a crime scene. Um, I put all that aside. I looked at this Malvo thing and um, one of the first things that jumped out at me is Jamaican. 
and it's making sense with what Lenny DePaul and Vinny Senzamici had been saying about a Jamaican uh, connection, as well as what the pastor had said about an accent and a younger man. So I, I still didn't know at that point anything connected to a, an older suspect. Um, but the fingerprints that had been submitted to the FBI that were matching the record was an immigration contact in Washington State uh, with Lee Boyd Malvo. So I got a hold of an immigration and naturalization service uh, agent, and I said, you know, I, I, I can't really tell you why, but I, I need all of this information from this file immediately. Uh, because within the information that I was seeing, um, it was one contact with law enforcement, but there was a, um, an A number in there or an immigration file number. So very soon afterwards, I started getting um, information in from immigration uh, about Lee Boyd Malvo, uh, pictures of him, uh, several several different pictures of him, a picture of his mom. And I started seeing a a a, a bunch of contacts in Washington state. Well, we had that, uh, that credit card that was attempted to be used uh, to purchase gasoline in Washington state. So we had a little something else going on there. He had had a number of contacts. The immigration contacts were based on local police having an interaction with him and then contacting immigration. So I got a hold of a, um, a colleague out in Seattle uh, who was with our electronic surveillance unit, and his name was Mark Jorgensen, and he got a hold of people in Bellingham, Washington, and started finding reports uh, with Lee Boyd Malvo, and so I started getting those in as and going through them as quickly as I could. Um, you know, he was a young man from Jamaica. I think he was 17 at that particular moment. Um, had not been in the U.S. very long. The contact with immigration had happened the previous December. And, you know, I, I had quite a bit of information there from a single contact because there there had been other information that had been uploaded into his file um, about he and his mom, you know, how they got into the United States and and, and things like that. So once I started reviewing these reports from the Bellingham police department, I started noticing that there was a, another individual often named in these things by the name of John Muhammad or John Williams. And in one of them, uh, it had been a report to the local police from a uh, counselor at a, at a local school. And in the report, Muhammad had been interviewed and referred to Malvo as his son. So now I had two directions to go. Now I had an older male involved in this that was consistent with what the pastor had said. And I started pulling information on John Allen Williams and or John Allen Muhammad. He had changed his name in, I believe, 1999. So I started getting reports in from them. I found out he was in the Army. I called a friend of mine with DOD and asked them to pull all their records, on, you know, from his military service. And, um, all of this seemed to be coming through um, to make sense finally. And I kind of learned over the years of working cases like this, very often you, you get a feeling right away that something is or is not making sense with the overall effort. With, with this, everything was just falling into place with these two people. So I was, I was making pictures of Malvo as quickly as I could and getting them out to the different command posts with information um, ab about him, his pedigree and everything. And I started talking to the different, um, command posts, kind of throwing a theory out there that, you know, these two guys have some sort of a relationship, you know, maybe father, son. Um, and I, I called a colleague at the command post and said, can you, can you run this name through John Allen Muhammad? Can you run this through the system that was collecting all the tips at that time is called Rapid Start. It was an FBI system to collect and analyze and disseminate tips. Well, he found one one interesting note in there, um, and it was from a an Army colleague of John Muhammad in Washington State, and his name was Robert Holmes, and he said that he was friends with a guy named Lee Boyd Malvo. 
and he even indicated that they had uh, that he had called him sniper. So, so can I just pause you there for a second? Sure. When that call, that tip that you just referenced, had you released to the public the name of Lee Boyd Malvo, or you're saying that this person called in and said, "Hey, these facts of these shootings fits a profile that I know of." No, I, I nothing went out to the public at this point. Um, I was still developing information um, on Malvo, and, and reports are flying in through email and fax machines on Muhammad. Um, and my briefings were to the different command posts in Fairfax and and uh, Prince William County and and Bowie, Maryland, um, and down in the Richmond area to to where those shootings had happened. Just telling them what I'm looking at here. Um, and so this tip had just come in. This this army colleague had called in saying this: the facts of these shootings fits a profile of my former friend that I called sniper. Yes. Yeah. He ca- he called it into the FBI tip line. Yeah. Someone had made note of it and put it into the system. Uh, there was no disposition on it. Uh, nothing had been done with it. The only markings on it I recall was a file number that related to a kidnapping allegation that Muhammad's wife had made against him because at one point he took their three children and, f- and fled to Aruba. Um, and so she had uh, contacted the FBI and filed a kidnapping report with them. Um, so that was the only reference on there. But nothing had been done with the tip. Mr. Holmes had not been contacted at that point. Um, it just validated for me a little bit that maybe there's something there. Um, and what, but- I'm, what I'm understanding here is that essentially, so the 17-year-old Lee Boyd had um, uh, run in essentially with local cops in Bellingham or Blaine, Washington, which is essentially the the northernmost U.S. city just below Vancouver, Canada. And upon realizing that he was either a some naturalized or some some sort of of citizen issue, they contacted then INS because it was before the creation of or installation of DHS. And so you were able to source a ton of records from Washington state that involved not only Uh, Lee Boyd as a minor and in the immigration system there, but also because then referenced in them was the John Allen Williams, John Allen Muhammad, which you learned he changed his name to uh, just three years prior to these shootings. So essentially you have a a situs connection between Washington State, Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama, and also then potentially now, um, you know, as you're looking for the shootings that were all in the DMV area, but this is at that point connecting Washington State with Alabama, which was referenced in the paperwork left um, behind at the scene in the DMV. Yeah, and referenced by the pastor, the, the 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 callers into the pastor had mentioned Montgomery, Alabama robbery as well, and they had also mentioned it to Derek Belisles, uh, and they they had referenced a Sergeant Martino with Montgomery County, but. He wasn't familiar with a Sergeant Martino in his department, but the callers were actually referencing a Sergeant Martino with Montgomery County, Alabama. So now you have been briefing all these different command posts with your hypothesis and with these all this evidence. And and then you you look in rapid start, you find that tip that had been called in from another person in Washington state. And then what happened? Well, when I went through all those phone calls, I probably did six, seven, or eight of them, um, I I really got no traction with anything except from an FBI uh, assistant special agent in charge in Richmond. After, you know, a 45-minute briefing on the phone, he called me back and he said, hey, I I think you're on to something here. He said, "Um, do you have a picture of Muhammad yet? I said, no, I'm, I'm working on it right now, actually. I, I think I told him that there was one in the immigration file because Muhammad also had an immigration file because he had some problems when he came back into the United States one time under an alias. Yeah. So, but the picture was very, very poor uh, quality. And I, and I didn't want to even throw that one out. There was, it was, you couldn't even make uh, sense of it. It was more of a, it looked like a copy of a copy of a copy uh, that was just a, a shadowy figure. So I told him, I said, you know, I'm, I'm working on it right now. And he said, send me the picture immediately when you get it. 
he said, I think you're on to something here. Would you, would you be willing to brief Director uh, Mueller in the morning on what you've got? And I said, well, I, I, I can, but not early in the morning because I had to brief my headquarters. One of the calls I had conducted that afternoon was with, with my investigative operations group. And they had scheduled a meeting for the next morning so that the director of the marshal service could be informed of all this. So I, I told the, the agent, I said, I, I can do it, but I can't do it right away. I have another meeting. So I had noticed in all of the stuff I had on John Muhammad or John Williams that he had both a Washington state and a California driver's license. So I called a friend of mine in San Diego that I used to work with. And I said, you know, I, I need this picture from the DMV. I, I, I've got to get this tonight. And he said, you know, I'm at, I'm at home right now. Can it wait till tomorrow? I said, no, I really can't. So, you know, whatever you got to do. He called me back about 20 minutes later. He said, I got your picture. You know, what's, what's the big urgency? And I said, you know, I think you're looking at one of the snipers in Washington, D.C. right now. I hope it's a good picture. And he said, yeah, it's a good picture. He sent it to me, and um, I think you have that picture as well that I, I provided mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a 1992 picture, I believe, of Muhammad. He's in his military fatigues because he was he was stationed in Pinole, uh, California at the time in the military. So mm -hmm. um, it was a great picture. When I, when I got an email to me, I sent it to the agent down in uh, Richmond. Uh, but I had also taken – all of the information from Muhammad and Malvo and sent a letter to the FBI in Clarksburg, West Virginia, that handles their uh, nationwide criminal information center. And I had asked for uh, an offline search. You know, has anybody been in contact with these two individuals with these dates of birth? Um, and they found nothing. Basically, where they contacted and a check was run and it showed nothing. Sometime after 5 a.m., I started getting the response from that. It was 100 pages long. It was a, a, a facsimile report, 100 pages long. And it's you got to go through it with a fine-tooth comb in order to really figure it out. Now, one of the things I saw in there immediately was there were people in – Fairfax, Virginia, and Montgomery County, and Richmond, that were all running John Allen Muhammad at this point. And I started to wonder, why, why is this happening? Well, they, it was all happening after the briefings that I was doing that afternoon. They, they took the information and they ran some records checks. So there, there were quite a few of those. But I found one in there from, uh, I believe it was, on the 7th or 8th, it was the night following the shooting of Iran Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I believe it's going to be the early morning hours of the 8th where mm -hmm. John Allen Muhammad is contacted by a Baltimore police officer. So getting the content of what happened was the next part of the investigation. So I got a hold of a, uh, a person in um, – Baltimore with our office there, the task force there. And I had asked him to reach out to Baltimore police department and, and find the, the reason for this contact, you know, was he walking down the street? You know, did, did he get arrested and he was in jail for a day or two? Um, what, what were the circumstances of that, of that contact? Well, it wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. Um, at the meeting with my director that morning was the chief deputy from that office, Don Donovan. And I described to him what was happening and who was doing all this research. And we needed to get that information. Had no idea what we were going to find. In the meantime, I had, I had done a financial report on John Muhammad or John Williams. And I still, you know, one of the things we were still trying to do is put them in the area, put them physically you know, in the area where the crimes are happening, because we did have Washington state data. We did have Alabama information, but we needed to put them there um, to, to start making this case, you know, and, and developing the evidence a little bit. Well, within that financial report, I saw that his ex-wife lived in Clinton, Maryland, mm -hmm. and I now had a reason for him to be there. Um, so it went on during the day where we were looking for that information with the contact with Baltimore. 
and as I'm just going through, you know, all of my records and reviewing things and sending out subpoenas and and grand jury subpoenas and working with two assistant U.S. attorneys uh, from Greenbelt, Maryland, um, I see on the news that um, they are now digging up a piece of property in Tacoma, Washington. And I I knew about this. This was the information from Robert Holmes was that, you know, they would often shoot at a tree stump. So there there would be projectiles there, maybe from the same rifle that is causing the deaths in the Washington, D.C. area. But that information was not supposed to be released. Um, I knew that they were getting ready to do it. um, But now it was on every news channel. And it was being connected to the sniper shooting. So my big fear was knowing that Muhammad and Malvo were monitoring the news. They were obviously watching it because they shot the child immediately after Chief Moose said, your children are safe. And he was gaining his intelligence that way, just like he had been trained in the, in the military. Um, I had to get out of the office for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was I was a little bit frustrated that we pretty much knew who they were at this point. We could develop the information. We could make this happen without anybody else getting hurt. Um, but now we just told them that we know who they are. Mm-hmm. So, you know, part of the fear was that, you know, a police officer may pull them over in, you know, West Virginia for a broken taillight, not knowing who they were but they weren't going to take a chance on finding out who they were. Um, I couldn't get that out of my mind. So when you identified that um, Muhammad's ex-wife lived in Clinton, Maryland, that aha moment that finally and decisively put for you a reason for him to be in that area. What steps did you take concerning the ex-wife and were her three children, their three children still minors under her care in that home? Did you, then uh, execute a search warrant on her home. What happened? What steps did you take regarding her? I got a hold of the, the Baltimore office, our, mm-hmm. our, our fugitive task force, and, and told them what was going on. And we, we established a surveillance at her place. Um, she was eventually contacted, um, but we got a surveillance on her location uh, with the children uh, uh, within probably an hour. Um, you know, we still didn't know um, what vehicle that we might be looking for. They had pictures now of Muhammad and Malvo, so they had a little but bit to go Baltimore on. the Baltimore police officer that had pulled him over, what car was that? Cause- well, that still was developing at that time. When I had left the office, you know, with the frustration that I had of airing the, the details in Washington State, I had come back to the office probably four thirty, five o'clock, and, and someone had told me that um, they had gotten a license plate from the – contact in Baltimore. I mean, I wasn't expecting that at all. Um, so I reached out to the, the deputy marshal in Baltimore and he described it that uh, an officer Snyder had seen the man sitting in the in the car at, at a donut place. A um, couple hours later, he sees him again. So he decides to contact him. He runs a check on him that comes back with nothing except a protection order. Um, and there, uh, there's only one person in the vehicle that he can see. And he also runs a license plate. It took uh, the technicians at Baltimore to go through uh, audio recordings. It took them six to eight hours to, to find this, but they finally found the audio recordings of making the, the inquiry on the name and date of birth and the license plate. Um, I was still not 100% convinced that this was the right person because there could be a lot of John Allen Muhammad's out there with similar dates of birth. So I had the picture. I sent it to the officer, and within a couple of minutes, he called me back, and he said, it's definitely 100% the guy that I spoke to. Mm. Now that puts him in the area. It puts him not too far from the shooting of Iran Brown less than 24 hours earlier. Um, So now I know that he's in the area. Now we know what car they're driving. We know what the New Jersey license plate is. We find out very quickly that it's registered to him. 
in New Jersey. He bought it for a couple of hundred dollars uh, from some money they stole during another shooting that was not connected to the other shootings immediately. Um, it would be later on connected to um, the owner of a restaurant who was robbed of his uh, computer and some cash and shot several times um, as he was closing his business one night. So they, they financed their, their, their murder spree and purchasing the vehicle uh, with that particular robbery in late September. Hmm. So now that we have the car, we have the license plate. Um, I'm still got a little bit of a problem with the two of them probably knowing that uh, the events in Washington are taking place. Are they going to dump the car? Are they going to jump on a bus for Chicago? Um, are they going to carjack someone? We, you know, we had to examine all possibilities at this point, but we still had to look for that one particular car that was the only one that we knew about. So there were meetings at the, at the jock. Um, I was not involved in them, but there were there were discussions about whether or not to publicize the license plate, and it was decided not to. Um, Leapoid Malvo was charged early that evening as a federal material witness. Um, they wanted to get a warrant in place for him um, as the case continued to develop. Well, material witness warrants are the responsibility of the Marshal Service. So we had to we had to get that information into NCIC, but I also had the idea of uh, putting an administrative message out to all law enforcement agencies across the country. And just for listeners, NCIC is the National Crime Information Center. So essentially, the where the collation of all that information is stored. Right. So an administrative message went out to tell people to be on the lookout for this uh, dark blue caprice with. Uh, New Jersey license plates as related to a federal material witness warrant for Lee Boyd Malvo. Um, I, I had called our communication center and asked for the message to be put out. And about 15 minutes later, I, I saw that the message was, uh, I, I looked at the message and it had no caution on it for police officers. Um, it also identified Lee Boyd Malvo as a white male. Mm -hmm. um, so I called back to the communication center and told them that, uh, I needed to have the message resent, corrected, and resent. And so they corrected all of that. Um, and it was shortly after that where those transmissions that went out to law enforcement from dispatchers are sometimes monitored by news media. And a radio station picked up on it and broadcast it. And a refrigerator repairman. Uh, on his way home back to Pennsylvania, saw the car in the rest area uh, along Interstate 70 um, in, in Maryland. And, and then? Yeah, from, from that point, I got a call uh, shortly after midnight, I think. I'm still in my office, still working the case. I mean, at this point, I'm working with, um, you know, the, the assistant U.S. attorneys, and I'm trying to get pen registers and traps and traces in place for the relatives that I'm aware of, of uh, John Allen Muhammad. He had family in Louisiana, um, trying to get all that in place because I, I, I didn't want to anticipate that this thing was going to be over. But I got a phone call from someone telling me that the car had been located at the rest area, that it was backed into a spot and that uh, Maryland State Troopers and FBI HRT and Montgomery County SWAT were all responding to the area, um, to a McDonald's up there where they were going to be staging, that they were shutting down Interstate 70, um, that they were placing canines in the median outside of that rest area, um, and that they were rehearsing to uh, do something with the car. The one problem that we had was uh, the witness, uh, I believe his name was Whitney Donahue, he had he did, had not seen any movement in the car. So it made me think again that, you know, maybe they saw the news coverage and abandoned the car there. You know, but at this point, abandoning the car there, they would have probably had to carjack somebody else or steal another car from that rest area 
So it would be important to us any, you know, other crimes or missing cars or stolen cars from that area that might have been reported and there weren't any. Um, so at that point, I kept doing what I had to do as far as court orders and and getting those things in place and just waiting for something to happen. And it was probably sometime after 3 a.m. where I got the first of, I think, three calls. I ended up getting calls from uh, one of my colleagues at the jock. I got a call from an ATF agent uh, up near the rest area. And I got a call from uh, Johnny Hughes, who was the U.S. Marshal in the District of Maryland at the time, and still is. Um, and all three of them told me that both of them were in custody at that time. Mm. And what was that like for you in that moment when you when you got that first call and first heard the news? Well, I was glad, definitely glad they were in custody. I was convinced that it was them at this point. There was a lot of investigation to be done in, in the days and weeks and months ahead of time to, you know, put these different cases in the different jurisdictions together for prosecution. Um, there were already little squabblings the next morning about who was going to get the, the first opportunity at them. Was it going to be the, the federal uh, authorities in Maryland? Was it going to be um, state authorities in Maryland, you know, so there was a lot of discussion about um, which laws were in place. There were some new terrorism laws in place in Virginia that allowed for some sentencing enhancements uh, for terror related crimes such as this. Um, so that's where it ended up going initially was to um, uh, Virginia to uh, for two prosecutions uh, and then uh, I think four or five prosecutions in Maryland to back that up, but there are still pending cases, um, you know, that could be filed today in Arizona and Florida and Texas and Louisiana and Alabama um, on those additional homicides that took place. Uh, should um, they need that? John Allen Muhammad was executed, um, so Lee Boyd Malvo is uh, still in prison. Um, his sentence is uh, being redone now based on a Supreme Court ruling uh, for sentencing uh, juveniles uh, to life in prison at the time, uh, you know, when they're a juvenile at the time they commit their crime. So he's being resentenced on a, on some of those cases, uh, but he has a, a quite a few more cases that could be prosecuted uh, should that need arise down the road. Being a minor at the time of those murders is what saved Malvo from uh, receiving the death penalty like Mohammed did. Um, but to your point, yes, now, uh, given a Supreme Court ruling, any life sentencing uh, without parole, especially is has been ruled unconstitutional and those sentences are being revisited right. um, across the country. You made a call that night, Bill, uh, you made a call to someone that, that you didn't talk about in your book. Who was that call to and why? I called my dad. Um, he had been kind of monitoring the case. I mean, he does that all the time anyway. So uh, I called him, you know, probably three thirty, four 4 o'clock in the morning just to let him know that, um, you know, both guys were in custody. I knew he'd want to know. So um, that was important. Proud dad. What strikes me in part about this case is, not only the jurisdictional and logistical absolute nightmare that this posed for the hundreds of agents working so diligently across all the agencies and in local and state uh, realms to to try to identify who was behind this, but also that it seems to me that at every step of the way you were working, you had to combat essentially which what was a decisive conclusion made by that profile. That because of the initial profile, as you said, it, it was developed over a certain amount of time. But the fact that it was a single you know, white male with this, the white paneled van that you had to consistently butt, abut that presumption, not only with your resources, but with your convincing. So when you spoke about, you know, briefing all of the command post heads and only one, you know, it, it just took one, but only one really accepted the idea and even to the very end, when, as you put out the warrant for a federal material witness, you had to correct the record. No, 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 guys, it's not a white male that have this correct information in it. Um, it seems to me that really set a tone for the investigation that seems that it could be frustrating or challenging at a minimum at times. 
Yeah, and, and it went a little bit further than that. Um, when I did the briefing to the director of the Marshal Service on that Wednesday morning, um, I had gone through everything with Muhammad and Malvo and how they were connected together and uh, their Washington State roots and that their wife was here. And, you know, at that point, we're still looking to, for, the, for the vehicle. And we're hours away from developing that information. Um, but when I, when I left that meeting and started driving back to Springfield, I got a call from um, one of the unit chiefs. And he said, listen, um, he said, I'm just trying to verify this. And we're trying to put this together so that the director can prepare a report to some members of Congress or something like that. And he said, but I just want to make sure that we're talking about two white males, right? And, and I said, no, we, they, are, they are both African-American. Uh, the young man is of Jamaican descent. John Muhammad was born and raised in Louisiana, but they are black males. And he said, but that's not what the profile says. I mean, even my own leadership was, was kind of saying we, we need to keep going with the, the profile here. We had been at a, um, I believe it was in um, Fair, uh, Prince William County. They had had a briefing in an auditorium after their shooting and we we went down there and one of the people that spoke was a profiler from Quantico and he put this profile up on the screen and talked about it and why they believe this and I remember myself and about three of the people that I was with we walked out of the room um we because we 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 could believe the profile if that's where the evidence and the information took us but we just weren't there yet and profiles are just largely based on examining previous crimes like that and looking at those averages of of what those uh suspects or actors uh are made up of so it it, it was something we had to acknowledge and and look at but you have to let the facts of the case determine where you're going with the investigation and and not things like that and it's so interesting to see how much weight those profiles carry. And again, it, as you point out, they are created because humans create them. And it, it sort of calls to mind in the Golden State Killer profile. Remember, the original profiler, pro, profiler had put in there, had determined he the killer likely had uh, shooting experience, military experience. She felt likely law enforcement experience. And her boss made her take that out. Oh. Um, and it was a fascinating, uh, fascinating example of essentially the level of persuasion. Often you have to go through to even submit those profiles, even get those approved. So, and then contrast that with here, which is essentially the profile all of a sudden carries as much weight as a piece of evidence does, or even more as you outline to your frustration. Um, cause frankly, the evidence didn't point to that after a while. So really yeah. interesting contrast. Yeah. You, you take those profiles and you give them the weight they deserve as part of the investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this particular case, I think the, the, the weight provided to the white box truck or the white utility truck and the, and the criminal profile were, were given too much weight. Um, and, and the investigation was tried to be pushed into those directions rather than just allow the information to come back and then work with uh, the evidence that we were developing. And notwithstanding what we just discussed, uh, what would you say is the biggest lesson that you learned or that law enforcement learned from that entire case? Uh, and, and what are you most proud of? You know, it was a, it was a great case. I, I've been involved in a lot of cases like this over the years where there are multiple agencies involved and, and geographic scope is broad. Um, the Andrew Cunanan case started in San Diego. Um, I was the, the coordinator of the task force during that case. He was from San Diego. He traveled to Minnesota and killed two people, went to Chicago and killed Lee Miglin, killed an individual in New Jersey, and then ended up killing Gianni Versace in uh, Miami, Florida. So the geographic scope of that was just as large as the uh, sniper case. It didn't involve as many agencies probably in the end. Um, we know now that the sniper case you know, went on for eight months, that it started in February in Tacoma, Washington, when Kenya Cook was, was shot by Malvo at the front door of Isa Nichols' house, who uh, was probably the intended target. Um, we know of all the other shootings that, took, that have 
took place during their rampage and where they got the weapons. So um, I was I was proud to be part of a of a great investigation that ended up you know convicting both of these individuals of, of what they did. Um, and I, and I was I was pleased with the outcomes. Uh, John Allen Muhammad deserved to be executed, mm-hmm. and Lee Boyd Malvo deserves to spend the rest of his life in prison. Thank you so much for your service. It's it's really your story is an incredible illustration of the tenacity, the level of attention to detail, um, and that that commitment, the determination to see something through based on facts and evidence, despite all of the challenges and pressures that we were just discussing, discussing it's, it's truly remarkable, Bill. It's been an honor to talk with you today and to have you spend your time with us. It really has been, um, no doubt you absolutely saved lives because clearly every day that went on that those two monsters weren't caught, they were, uh, delighting in continuing their murderous spree. And it was a horrifying chapter of us history. It was a horrifying year. Um, but you put an end to it. Thank well, you. and and it was um, it was a pleasure to work a case like that, and and work with the thousands and thousands of law enforcement people across the country. It wouldn't have got done with one person or two people. It it took the work of thousands of people and hundreds of agencies over four or five years after that first shooting to put these cases together and determine all of the shootings and all the homicides they were involved with. So. Um, when, when you can work with a large group like that and have the success that we had within a few short weeks to not only determine who they were, but to get them in custody and successfully prosecuted is the, the end of what you do. So, and it's a reflection on that investigative effort. So there were thousands of people, uh, prosecutors and administrative employees and, you know, people from uh, uh, cellular carriers that we were working with on a daily basis. And, um, you know, there were hundreds from the Marshal Service, but there were thousands from another hundred agencies across the country. And it, it was a, it was a case that you don't forget. And what I love about your, the story is how it also underscores each touch point, those thousands of individuals, how everyone plays that part that then pivots the story in that then trajectory that leads to a point of no return for identifying those men ultimately, you know, from canine beacon to the ATF agent that had the ballistics under control and, and Washington state and California DMV. I mean, it was, it's a really, really remarkable uh, constellation of figures that each had a material impact on the case. Yeah, it was, it was a, it was a pleasure to work the case and work with all those people. Bill, do you have any last message or any last words that you want to share with listeners? I don't think so. <laughs> I think we covered it. Well, we covered it. Um, but so much more. Uh, your book, Chasing Evil, is incredible. I recommend it, of course, so highly. And um, we'll put all the information below with how folks can find you and listen to more of your incredible stories. Because this one on the Beltway Snipers case is just the tip of the iceberg of your illustrious career, sir. So thank you again for your service. Thank um, you. 